useful code. I have spent many hours trying and testing scripts only to apply a pressure or figure out what is the name of this tree's children or how can I select this face. Hopefully this time is not spent in vain and I can distill this into some useful code that you can use. So onto the key codes you can use. To start off, all objects and methods have a unique ID in Mechanical. The ID is not always clear, but that can be found out rather easily. To show you what I mean, if we have a look in the tree, we can see the ID for some of the objects. That brings us to the first bit of useful code, which is the external API selection manager current selection ID. This code will return the IDs of whatever you have selected in the GUI. This can be used for bodies, faces, edges and vertices. On top of that, it will return the IDs in the order in which they were selected. This is probably the most useful code to quickly get IDs for scopings. And as soon as you have run that code, you can make a selection where you can copy and paste the IDs and set it to a variable. The next extremely useful code for navigating the tree is to get the path to the first active object. When you are in the tree, this will return the path to where you currently are. If I click on my last contact region, it will return the path of that object. This can be particularly useful when you have multiple contacts and or bodies and no time to count them from the top down. It is also helpful to name a variable for that active object as soon as you have an output if you need to use it for something else. The next useful code that I have often used is visible properties. To demonstrate this, I can run contact1 visible properties. This will return a list of all the visible properties that we have access to in a list form. You can see that the previously manipulated contact type is there. I have often used this code when I thought that something was called a different name, such as type, only to get an error. The reason I am highlighting this particular code is because there is also a properties option. I used to use this, but as you can see when I run it, the output is extremely long and the properties are not always applicable to your current analysis. The next code to highlight is the quantity expression often used to define values. To demonstrate this, I can change the pinball radius on a contact. Changing the pinball radius is often useful in simulations and I would like to show you how tricky the API can be. So let's change contact 1's pinball radius. As you can see, I specified a contact pinball radius of 5 millimeters with the quantity. Now, if you look in the GUI, we can see that the pinball radius, even though we have changed it, is not visible. If we dig a little deeper and click on program controlled, we can now see that we have correctly defined 5 millimeters as the pinball radius. But this is too easy. So instead, I will change it back to program controlled and see if I can show the 5 millimeter pinball radius with my API skills. So I will say, or alternatively, I could also use. From the two codes that I've just run, you can see that the new pinball radius is in fact 5 millimeters. But if you're like me, I wouldn't believe it until I see it so I probably still would have run both codes just to check. The quantity is also used to define boundary conditions, but this requires additional information. Boundary conditions are an important topic, so I will go into more depth on this next. Boundary conditions. One of the tasks that can benefit the most from automation would be applying boundary conditions. Typically, for similar products, you will have similar designs and similar loading conditions, where 
you can automate the application of boundary conditions. This is a huge time saver when you have hundreds of boundary conditions to apply. To demonstrate how to apply boundary conditions, I will use the example snippet available in Mechanical. Snippets can be used for code that you often use, but I'm not going to go into much detail on snippets. Now I will run the snippet code. As you can see, we have easily scoped a boundary condition to the faces selected. The way I prefer to do it is to make a named selection and apply boundary conditions to named selections. I will now create a named selection P on my faces and I will then type in the following code. Maybe it is just because it is my own code, but this method makes more sense to me in the way I have applied it and removed unnecessary code. Now that I have demonstrated how to apply boundary conditions, I need to give a bit more background. For boundary conditions, we have inputs and outputs. The input is typically time and the output is typically our quantity or magnitude. But the bus does not stop here. Boundary conditions can be defined in multiple ways. The three ways in which you can define boundary conditions are as discrete inputs, where you give discrete input and output quantities. As a formula, where the output is a function of another variable, this would be a location or time. And the last is free, as I'm sure you are familiar with, typically used for displacement boundary conditions. When you define boundary conditions, you must be very particular because when it is not specified or conflicting conditions exist, mechanical will always opt for the least complex condition. To demonstrate the inputs and outputs, I will now redefine my pressure to be a discrete function of time. First, I will need to increase the number of time steps in the analysis. This can be accessed in the analysis settings, where I will change it to two. Now I can redefine my loading to be a function of time at 0 seconds, 1 second and 2 seconds and I will re-quantify my pressure to match those time increments. Before we finish up with boundary conditions, I will just show you how to change the direction of the applied boundary condition. First, I will delete the pressure I previously created. Now we can insert the following code. The code remains exactly the same, except I will now use the load defined by dot vector, and the direction will be defined as a 3D vector where I can input three directional quantities. When I've run this code, as it is displayed in the GUI, you can see we have successfully changed the boundary condition direction. As you can see, there's a lot to unpack from this simple demonstration, but hopefully these basics will be able to get you started.